So I'm going to be doing uh, part two in this series. And, uh, you know, I just want to kind of bring you back into the mindset of this message. And, you know, as I said last week, I mean, it's no secret. There's lots of, lots of negativity in the world. Uh, not just negativity. Um, this, this world we're living in, if you go all the way back to the, the book of uh, Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, there was a curse that came over the earth. And we live in this terrarium. We live in this earth. And people go, why is there so much bad? You know, why is there so much bad? Why is there, because we live in a fallen world. And Jesus came into this world and he said, hey, you can unplug from that. You can, I'm building an, a kingdom. And he said, you can come into my kingdom. You can come out from among them. You can come out from among them. She's like, stop pinching me while I'm crying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, um, and so, and so, this, you're surrounded. You're surrounded. You're in this world where there is, if you're not careful, you just straight up become a product of where you're living. And you have to choose to master your atmosphere. You have to choose how you're going to live, how you're going to think, how your family is going to live. You have to make choices for your little ones. And, and you're either going to master the atmosphere or you're going to be mastered by the atmosphere. Come on. The Bible says, I think it's 1 John uh, 2, 7, 2, 9. Uh, it says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. When Jesus came here, he said, I will not be mastered by the atmosphere, but I will, I will master the atmosphere. Jesus, Jesus basically went out into the world with his environment strapped on his back like a scuba diver goes into the ocean and lives in an environment that he couldn't normally live in, and that's the way the Christian is supposed to live in this world. We have a different environment that we can strap on and carry with us. Come on. But you have to choose that. You have to choose it. Say, I choose life. You have to choose life. You have to choose to live in the victory that Jesus secured for you on his cross, at his crucifixion. And if you are passive, you'll not drive out the darkness. You have to stand up with unrestrained positivity and with logical action. You have to live intentional. Say that with me. I live intentional. Or by default, you'll be hostage to not knowing what you truly want, not knowing what is available to you, and by not making plans for getting there. And though it, it doesn't always seem like it, you have the power of God inside of you. Believers in Jesus, can you say yes? You have so much power inside of you. Your world can start to change. All these songs they were singing today, your world can start to change. You can move mountains. You can move mountains. Somebody say you. You know, you can move mountains. And, but you have to become irritated enough with current circumstances so that you will rise up with your own, in your own realm with faith and corresponding action, and that is when things will begin to change. And so I'm doing a series called Master Your Atmosphere, and I'm talking about every part of life, the parts of life, like the parts of of a good environment, the parts of life. And I started last week by talking about your relationships. And, and, I, and I've been hearing from people all week. Some people are literally becoming that logical, like I presented in that sermon. You can choose. Somebody, of course, challenged me on my Facebook, and I don't mind challenges to give me the opportunity to clarify where I might not have covered a certain angle. And somebody said, yeah, but doesn't that sound kind of elitist that you're saying you're going to only spend time with positive people? And I do want to clarify that. Jesus spent time with everyone giving himself for the masses that they could be healed by his life. But he did choose 12 disciples, and he did, of the 12, choose an inner circle of three. And he permitted them access where others didn't have access. And you have to choose who is going to walk with you, who you're going to spend your time with, and even more than that, who's going to be in the inner, inner, inner circle. Because when you choose those people, you are choosing in large the kind of life that you're going to have. 
Somebody said, uh, one, of the, one of the great authors of our day has been quoted as saying, you are the average of the five people you spend all of your time with. It is very difficult for you to rise and be a champion if you're, if you're spending all of your time with negative, darkness-filled people. It's going to be really hard for you to break away. So we talked about that last week, and this week I want to talk about mastering your atmosphere by mastering your health. And I want you to look at somebody next to you and say, God wants you healthy in every way. All right. So here is why. And so you look at me and you go, well, what qualifies you to teach us about health today? Here's why I'm qualified to teach you about health today. Okay, you ready for this? Because that's me without my shirt on. A lot of people don't know that. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I even got the skin color matched. It's so good, man. So good. Uh, I'm going to put that up on my dream wall, right? Um, so, dang, I didn't realize that there is a long time before the next slide comes up. So, <laughs> that, that can be awkward. Uh, so, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I don't look at myself in the mirror, because it's very intimidating. You know, that's... It's what I have to look at, you know. It's just another life and being John Higginbotham. So, uh, but you know, um, so Emily sends me a text. She knew I was working on this message. We've talked about it a lot this week. And Emily's my wife, and she runs lots of marathons. And, and so she's always running. And she sent me a text, and she goes, you know, I'm thinking about your sermon tomorrow. And I guess for me, health is not just for looks. It's if you're, if you're not a healthy person, You'll never be able to do what God has called you to do, like work hard at your job, or for me, to be a good mom, or a good grandma, or to go out and share my faith, or do whatever it is that God's called me to do. And I was like, oh, that's good, man. That, that's good. So I just cut and pasted it. Of course, Siri didn't say it just like that, because she spoke it into her watch, I think. And um, the reason, so then she says to me this. She says, the reason I'm thinking about this is I just had a long conversation with someone on the cheese shop road uh, as part of her path there. It's the road across the street from the cheese shop. It's part of her loop. And she, she said, and I've seen how this person is, how not taking care of his health has really limited him as to where he is right now. Not just with the cancer, but with bad eating and lack of exercise, she said, I want to take care of myself so my body won't break down like that. Anybody with me right now on this? You know, for the younger people, some of this sermon is just going to be really hard for you because I admit that you can just eat every cheeseburger you want for about 10 years. You're not going to have anything to worry about. Your body will probably just blow it straight out. It's no big deal. Um, However, I, I, I believe that if you can get control of yourself at a young life, even with parents, in the way you're training children, and we did a very bad job with our kids, and I apologize. Um, I loved having ice cream and bagels with my kids, and it was one of the funnest things ever. And so I trained them to love all bad foods, bags of Doritos and Skittles, and, and you know, I don't even, honestly, there are times in my life, I don't even know how my, my eyeballs open in the morning on the stuff I put in. You know, it's like, it's like looking for fuel, looking for fuel, looking for fuel. <laughs> and I wake up, and I'm like, oh, I feel bad. It's old age. No, it's, you just didn't put anything good in for the, like the last seven days in a row. It's amazing. You're even breathing, you know. Come on, anybody? Isn't it amazing? Like, if you did that to your automobile, it would not run. It is amazing how much grace God gives to the human body and how it will just run on some of the stuff that you put in it, right? Are you guys with me right now? Somebody goes, my God, I didn't want to come to this today, man. I got a good lunch plans. I understand. I'm not expecting us to make any kind of changes right now. Um, oh, yeah, I am. I'm expecting massive change, to be honest with you. <laughs> I told Emily, I was like, Em, let's really pay attention to this sermon. Like, like, let's really, both of us, let's really pay attention to this sermon. And let's try the hardest we ever had in our lives to try to, like, live long, you know, and live and set ourselves up for a better life. Um, look at this verse here. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. 
It's a scary verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It's a very scary verse because what God is actually saying is, I know you'd like to have your body all to yourself, do whatever you want to do with it, but you need to know that when you got born again, we, be, we went into partnership on your body. And the Holy Spirit is living in there, and you've become a temple where the Holy Spirit lives, and so your body matters to God. Big. Let me tell you why your body matters to God. If you die young for not taking care of your body... If you die young for not taking care of your body, the Holy Spirit has to go get into somebody else's body to influence the people that God was trying to influence through you. Come on, guys, right? Like, I think to myself, man, if, if I were to die young, and that's not going to happen, but if I were, you know, my kids, they don't even realize it now, and they won't tell I'm gone, and I'm going to live so long that... They're going to be old too when I finally die and they'll already have the epiphany. But isn't it sad that a lot of kids don't even realize how much strength that a parent is providing in their lives? Just being there, just those text messages you send back or the phone calls or listen to them absorbing the stuff that you absorb. Parents are very necessary and, and grandparents, very necessary, aunts, uncles, and uh, in, in, the light, in, in the life of your kids. Your body was made for a great purpose. Do you believe that right now? To fulfill your purpose, you have to live long and with a certain level of fitness. You know, to, to go the distance with your life. Now, I understand there are people like some of the missionaries who went out into dangerous parts of the world and died martyrs for Christ. And the Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. And so when you take on a dangerous calling like that and you do something like that, I still believe that the Apostle Paul shows us that your time isn't up until your time is up unless you do stupid things. Come on, guys. Because even the Apostle Paul escaped death several times. Even Jesus escaped death until his time had come. And God will give you wisdom so that you can live as long as possible. How many of you want to live as long as possible? I mean, yeah. Um, you know, um, your body was made for a great purpose. And so um, there's, there was that one missionary, uh, Nate Saint, who said, um, I, I, God, he wrote in his journal, I don't want a long life, but I want a full one like you, Lord Jesus. He was saying that if my life is short, I want to live like Jesus did, and I want to make the greatest impact in my life. See, I want to make the greatest impact, but I also want to live long. It's the only difference between me and him. How many of you can agree with that kind of philosophy? I want to make the greatest impact in the shortest years, but I want to live a long time. And so, if you've, um, if, if you've, um, if you're below the standard, you can bring yourself up to the standard. If you've given up on yourself, you can get up and fight to live again. Can you say yes to this? You know, you can make drastic changes now and have your health back within a few years of living on purpose. And I believe that. The neat thing about your body is it will regenerate. If you start doing the right thing to your body, it'll bounce back. That's the amazing thing. You might be waking up every day and go, my God, this is over for me, man. It's just, I just got more of this lack of energy. I'm just running out. No, 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 no. Don't buy into that. Don't believe that. You know, I think about Dorothy Hall who's in the back. She's over 90 years old. And you know that woman still drives her own car? She actually goes and gives other people visits. You know, like, she, she actually takes people to hospital appointments and stuff like that. She lives in her own house. She drives her own car. And she's over 90. And I'm like, my God, I don't just want to make it to 90. I want to make it to 90 living in my own house, driving my own car, taking other people that are in their 60s to their doctor's appointments and, and, and then she just goes, uh, um, I'm planning on going over 100 like this. Hey, man, and if you know anything about that family, the stuff that I'm about to teach you is the stuff that they live. And so I believe that in God's grace, people just make it defying all the odds, <laughs> breaking all the laws and principles. God is so merciful. But I don't want to make it just purposely breaking all the laws. I want, I want to figure out how it can be done so that I can live in a way that I allow God to work through my life on the maximum level. Are you with me right now on this? Completely. So you might have to fight through some generational curses. Some families are prone to bad health, sickness, 
and hardships of all kinds. You want to know why? Because those are the families that say dumb things like this. When it rains, it pours. Don't get offended with me because I know people in here say that. Stop saying that starting today. Right? When it rains, it pours. My God, what's next? No, 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 no. Stop. Cancel, 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 cancel. Stop bringing the devil into your life by by creating patterns of thinking that look for more and more disaster. And you go, what do I do? My God, you, if you grew up like that, then you have a generational curse of wrong thinking, and you've got to stop that as soon as possible before you die. Amen? Okay, so you might have to fight through these, um, but you can break these curses for the sake of your legacy. You can break these curses. Your kids are watching everything you say and do. The way you react to sickness is the way they're going to react to sickness. The way you react to, to poverty and lack and things falling apart is the way they're going to react to those to hardships. When they see you moving mountains, the pattern of moving mountains is going to be inside of your kids. Psalm 78 talks about this. It says that the older generation has to show the kids in the younger generation the miracles so that those the next generation can set their hope anew in God. It is up to us to show our kids that there's still a powerful God, that our family has served, and that powerful God can transfer to the next generation. Yes. And so if you've inherited this, you can change the atmosphere. The bottom line is that many people have developed unhealthy lifestyles, and it's going to take effort for change, but you have to value the people you love. You have to want to live long, healthy, and happy enough that this, and if you do, this teaching will help. This teaching will help if you want to live. I can't want to live for you. But if you want to live, man, then God has something available for the people in this church today. This is that kind of sermon that could, man, I, I don't know how this goes over in this generation, but back in the 1990s, I was in a church in Murfreesboro, North Carolina, and I prayed. We were talking about this in prayer meeting the other night. I'm, you can believe me if you want to or not, but there were like a couple of months in a row where every single person I prayed for who had diabetes you go, my God, you're one of those. All I can say is they were coming back from their doctor's appointments and going, my doctor just said, I haven't taken my insulin in three days. My doctor said that my sugar is at the perfect level. I can't believe it. This is the first time this ever happened. It's a miracle. I would testify it. Somebody else would come forward. We'd pray for that person. And it was like, there were like seven to 10 cases of diabetes. Every single person, it was just the most amazing thing. I have seen God do miracles. There are people in this church who have received miracles. If you bring God into your health, that would be a good thing. Amen? Don't just go, you know, here's another philosophy that would ruin your life. Whatever's meant to be will be. You know, we're just going to accept this. Do not accept what Jesus came to earth to fight against. He came to fight against the works of the devil. You as a believer should also stand representing him as a temple of the Holy Spirit and fight against that which Jesus fought against the three and a half years he was here on earth. Okay, so you can continue to master your atmosphere by today, we're continuing this, by employing or using three forces, three forces of health. Um, three forces of health, and, and I'm going to give you forces. I'm going to call these forces. We're talking about mastering the atmosphere. Forces, very simple, and I'll give them to you right now in case you want to leave early. So, so hopefully you won't. Here they are, faith, grace, and self-discipline, or corresponding action. Say it with me, faith, grace, self-discipline, corresponding action. So I'm going to give it to you real simple, and I'm going to tell you what I'm about to say is one of the biggest announcements about my own life I think I've ever made before because this is a huge deal for my life. And I hope that there are people in here who need to hear this. And you're going to go, my God, that's it for me too. I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind. And I can't believe that I finally, at 46 years old, just figured out that this was the biggest blind spot concerning my health. Biggest blind spot concerning my health. For most of my life, I held a belief, a deadly belief, that I was going to die young because the gene pool in my family, and I remember when I learned about genetic determinisms in Bible college. The, there's environmental, there's genetic, there was one other, there three that we really focused on. Determinisms, that if you don't learn how to walk by faith, 
that these things will determine so much in your life. And I had accepted the genetic pool, the genetic determinisms over my life. My mom died at 54. My uncle died at 44. I'm 46. Heart disease from mom and dad. And so what I've said to Emily so many times over the years, my God, you could live 40 years longer than me. And you want to know, I'm telling you, I'm getting ready to blow your mind. And I'm not making this up. I just had this epiphany this week. I've never seen myself in a vision. I've never seen myself as, as an old person. I've joked around, one of these days when Emily and I are old, we'll be on a rocking chair. And we'll, but I've never seen myself. I have never seen myself much more than my 40s and 50s. I've never seen it. I have just, for so many years of my life, I just accepted that I'm just going to go and I'm going to live the greatest, boldest life. And when I'm gone, you know, I'll have lived it like, you know, what the average person doesn't get done by 125 years of life. I'm just going to live. I'm going to live. I'm going to live the fullest. I'll make everything count. And then if I die young, so what? I've lived full. But then I think to myself, that's the dumbest philosophy to hold on to. That I'm just going to, I'm going to sprint and die. I want to sprint and marathon. Come on. The Bible says, and if you grow weary, it says, uh, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Do you know that's a reference to eagles? And do you know what eagles do about, uh, you know, eagles live to be a, a, a long time in life, you know, many decades. And about halfway through their life, an eagle will go through what's called the molting process. They preen every day. It's really cool. Their beak actually is like a steam cleaner, and it releases the steam through the beak that they go through a pre-flight, you know, uh, checklist before they fly every day, going over every feather, preening their feathers, cleaning off. But over the years, some of the feathers break, and they get frail from all the flight and all they've gone through. And what an eagle will do about halfway through their life is that they'll climb up on a high place in the mountain, and they'll pluck out every feather. And if you go look online, look at what this looks like. It's a wild thing, looking at a naked eagle standing there with all the feathers plucked out. They'll even break off their, their talons. They'll break off their beak, and they'll sit there in the sun, waiting for the sun to come and dry the skin. And through this process, if you watch the eagle, you think that eagle is doomed, it's dying, but what will happen is the eagle will grow back new feathers, new talons. The beak will be renewed. And the eagle is the master of renewing itself. And the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. He's talking about midlife to end life that you'll still be going strong. Yes? Man, all the older folks are friends of mine today because I, you're like, my God, I feel so much energy. Honey, let's sign up for a marathon, you know? It's amazing what you can get jacked up and do if you're in a good church service, you know? Let's bungee jump, boom. <laughs> um, and so I want to be like Joe and Kay. I don't know if they put that up there already. Look at this beautiful couple there marathoning. I don't know how old they are, but isn't that the cutest thing ever? You know, I like looking at cute old people going across. I saw one at the traffic light in draft. I saw this couple going up to Hardee's. But, you know, <laughs> that's cute. But I want to be this couple here. God bless you for your discount at Hardee's. Uh, again, God gives lots of grace. And just, you should just thank God every day you're still alive if you're doing that all the time. Okay? But what I'm saying is, I want to do this, man. I want to run marathons. I want to climb mountains. I want to hike. I, wanna, I just want to be in old age and still going strong. And I want my wife there with me. I want at about 98 years old or so, who knows, maybe 105. Dorothy's raising the bar for me because i got to beat Dorothy. It's about a competition here. Who can live the longest? Uh, but I just want to look over at Emily and just high-five each other, hold our nose, and jump into heaven. Come on, guys, right? So, okay. This week while I was working on the sermon, here's what happened to me. I read Jeremiah 29, 11. I read Jeremiah 29, 11. And I've, this is why you need to read the, keep reading the Bible. 27 years later, you need to keep reading the Bible every day. Because you never know. 
Sometimes it'll get mundane, and you're just reading it, you're reading it, and all of a sudden, one verse could change a year of your life, a decade, or even add 40 years to your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, and God speaking to Jeremiah through Jeremiah, and he says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Let me give it to you exactly how it is. They are plans for good and not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Somebody say, I have a future and a hope. See, it's and it's not just a future. You're not just going to exist. You're going to exist with hope, with dreams. Hope is another word for dreams. I have a future. God says, I have a future for you, and I have dreams for you all the way to the end of your future. And I read that, and I was like, man, he says, there are plans for good, not disaster. It says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. And if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. And I read that, and I thought, God, do you have a dream for my future? Do you see me in my 90s? And I had never thought about this before. And I think that for the first time in my life, I have finally, for the first time in my entire life, I've stepped into faith that I'm going to live a long life and a life with dreams all the way to the end. Now, I don't know if there's anybody else that deals with what I'm dealing with. I'd have to think that that's the weirdest thing ever and that nobody else thinks like this. I'd love to know if there's anybody else in here that does think like this. I'm afraid to ask for a raise of hands. But is anybody else really relating with this? Like, I'm so glad you preached this because I kind of felt the same thing. Hands already going up. If that's you, raise your hand. A couple over here. Okay, so nobody else. It's just a few of us. Let's get coffee. So, so this is where healthy living begins. It begins in your belief system. Do you talk too much about your aches and pains and all the other negative things happening? Are you obsessed with family genes and mostly feeling defeated and you feel like you have no control over your health? I think it's good to go to those things maybe and find out what your, what your genetics are and all that stuff. But man, you need to be careful. Oh, I read on a report that I'm going to have Alzheimer's or I read on a report, man, do not let that stuff get into your soul. Just because something might be in your genetics doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Man, and it is amazing. The devil would love for you to read a report about your future, and you know, oh, I'm prone to this, or I'm prone to that. I'm going to end up having a heart attack. And you start thinking about it. Man, you've got to cancel that stuff right now. And you've got to believe that you can live by faith in Jesus and that you can outlast those predictors. Can you say yes? And so, are you dreading what might happen to you next? If I were to ask for hands to go up on that, I bet lots of them would because there are lots of people who are just dreading. I don't know what's going to happen to me next. I just don't have a good feeling right now. I don't have a good feeling. I don't want to talk about it, but I don't have a good feeling. You've got to get the beliefs, the right beliefs, all the way down to the feeling level. That's when you know that you've shifted into faith. You've got to get those beliefs of health, of long life, of dreams, of wellness, deep down inside of you. This is where good health begins. You're going to believe that God has plans for you to be healthy and to live a long life. Say this with me. I believe God has plans to keep me healthy and to live a long life. So, now watch this. Well, brother, I just... Chuck, that just sounds like a little, I've been joking a lot lately about brother and sister stuff, and now it's coming out in my sermons. Um, I've just been like, well, brother, and now it's coming out in my sermons. So here's the thing. Job said this. You know who Job is? He's like the guy with the biggest trial that anybody's ever gone through pretty much. Like literally he lost his kids. He lost all of his business. He basically lost everything and he's laying there, and he's just, he's like, my God, like, what has happened to me? And this is what Job says after all that stuff went down. You ready for this? He said, and I quote, what I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. I wrote in my notes, if you are a Christian, you need to shift into faith in God for your health and do it as soon as possible. You don't want to wake up too many days in a row 
fearing what might happen to you, dreading what might come. Because Job is making a connection here. He says, I obsessed over these things may be happening. And sure enough, they did. And I, there are lots of different ways for you to read that situation with Job. Um, you know, Job was making sacrifices for his kids every day, saying, if perhaps my kids have done some big sin, I'm going to make sure I cover it. Who in the world does, I'm, I'm just saying, that's the way I read it. I see a guy who literally believed that his kids would die young. He was dreading and fearing that bad things were going to happen to his family. And as he was dreading that and fearing that, he finally says out of his mouth, and the Bible doesn't write stuff down just to write it down. It has spiritual meaning. And he says, the thing that I always thought about, the thing that I always feared about has happened. Are you with me on this? So you don't want to say amen because you're just not sure what you believe about this. But I'm saying this. Wouldn't it be better than to obsess over what might happen, to obsess over your family genes, to obsess over what might, treading over what could be coming next? Wouldn't it be better and more productive and more healthy for you to expect good things to happen in your life? Come on, guys. Wouldn't it be better for you to expect yourself to be healthy, to expect yourself to live a long life, to expect yourself not to get the flu? Come on, man. I remember the first time I heard about Kenneth Hagin talking about how he said, he wrote down in his journal, that last flu I had was the last flu I'm ever going to have for the rest of my life. I declare over me. And he starts quoting all this stuff, and he said, here I am like 50 years later, and I haven't had the flu one time. People go, oh, man, come on. That's just, you know, I don't know how that could happen. I tried it myself, and I went many years without having the flu. I had the flu a couple of years ago. I had the flu, and then finally was like, whoa, I forgot to believe right. And then I started believing right again, and guess what? I haven't had the flu in a long time. Everybody's like, I hope he gets the flu. <laughs> Come on. So then I can feel okay with my flu. Self-righteous about your no flu. But what I'm saying is this. I've tried this stuff, and when you build faith over your life, the enemy cannot attack you. This is where good health begins. Um, I want you to say this affirmation with me. I am... Living a long, healthy, and fruitful life. Yes. Okay, you got to say yes, karate chopped. That's how you get an affirmation. That's how you actually program it. It's like you say the affirmation and you, and you hit save by shouting yes. So now I want you to give me one more. I am reaching the three summits of wellness, success, and impact. Yes. See? And it's so important for you to do that. Give me some scriptural background. Well, the Bible said, Richard's so fired up back there, who knows what's happening. Um, you have to build a shield of faith over your life. Have you heard this verse before from Ephesians chapter 6? In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. You know what the shield of faith is? The shield of faith isn't, oh, I'm sick, will you heal me, God? The shield of faith is, I believe sickness can't get on me. It's a shield. I believe the fiery arrow can't make its way to my life. You need to build a, a, a belief for you and your family that stuff that gets everyone else doesn't get you. A thousand shall fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh your dwelling. That's Psalms 91. You have to choose to believe, and that belief, that faith, puts a shield over your life. And you know what? That shield will work while you're sleeping at night. And the enemy just can't get in to your life. And the Lord says, Psalms 91, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call upon me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. That is a promise. And I believe that God is rewarding me with a long life. Because the only qualification it says, because they've loved me. Because, because they've believed in my name. Therefore, I'm going to give them these things. How many of you love God? How many of you believe in him? How many of you believe in his omnipotent power? Then let's put a shield up over our stuff. Let's put a shield up over our homes, over our businesses, over our kids, over our neighbors. Uh, let's put a shield up over our church. That's why we call our prayer meeting the shield. Because we believe, even if just a few of us, we come in here and we start praying for our church and we're putting a shield up over you. You wouldn't believe what these people pray over the families in our church. 
They hear about somebody facing a situation in life. They're praying, and this happens every week. It's a beautiful thing. By faith in God, I intend to live long and prosper in every way. Who's with me? Raise your hand. Okay, so there's faith. Let me get you to say a couple other things. Say this with me. Um, Every cell in my body is healthy. Say this. I have power to make healthy food choices. Somebody was like, I almost couldn't say that one. (laughs) All right, one more. Um, Say this with me. God is giving me 100 years and more of wellness, success, and impact. That's my personal philosophy. I think those are the summits that God wants us to ascend to. Wellness, success, and then our life matters for the purpose of making a difference. And that's why God wants you to live a long life. The second one, the second force to employ or to use is the force of grace. It's not enough just to believe. You have to bring God's power into your life. You have to choose to use God's power instead of relying only on natural means. The Bible says some may trust in horses and some may trust in chariots, but we will believe in the name of the Lord our God. Are you with me? Some people only trust in natural means, but we will believe in the name of the Lord. We will trust in the name of the Lord. You know, it's awesome to read the Bible and see how God moved. Do you remember the one time when Jehoshaphat was out? He, he, had, he had three armies facing him. Um, three armies were literally in alliance against him. And he's there, and he's got these armies all around. And a prophet, Jehoshaphat, just said, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Watch. Are you with me right now? So when you face a situation, and you look like you're outnumbered, and you look like, it's, like there's no way this can work out, start with God. Go straight to him first. Are you hearing this? So you go like this. You go, God, this is bad. I I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And you know what happened? The prophet spoke. Well, I I wish I could get a prophet. Well, you know, for (laughs) $19.99, you can, no, just kidding. But, But here's the thing. So you have the prophecy Every word of God is available for you. It's written, it's sealed. The canon of Scripture is there. If you can't find a prophet, then you can find the written Scriptures. The prophet spoke. He waited for a word from God. You know what the word was? You won't even need to fire one spear over at the enemy. All I want you to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In other words, God's going to do it for you. Have you stopped believing that God will do stuff for you? I know I do sometimes, and man, I want to step into the greatest season of faith that I've ever lived in in my life, because you know what? I've been pacing myself for an early death, and now I'm like, dang, I could live another 40 or 50 years. (laughs) I'm going to have to start getting in faith again, and it just opened me to all these possibilities of what could happen in my future. It's exciting, man. Man, if you can go from 46, when a lot of people are starting to plan their retirements, and you go, man, what if I make it to 100? I'm like halfway there. I believe a decade is a lifetime. If you live a decade right, you could change the world in 10 years. Jesus did it in three and a half. What could happen if you had a couple of decades left or four or five of them left? So much could happen, but you got to get in faith, and it's going to take, it's going to take some miracles. And so what did Jehoshaphat did? He, he do. He sent the praise and worship team out in front. That's why we should never underestimate what can happen in a worship set. Don't just read the lyrics, and it's like, oh, we got, we got a cool hip band, and this is what we're doing. Man, you read those lyrics Engage your mind. Listen to what they're saying. Contemplate and pray and worship God and praise him for what he's done and what he's doing, what he can do. And as you do that, they sent the worshipers out in front. The Bible says that God went ahead of them and that the armies that were against Jehoshaphat ended up turning on each other and they all annihilated one another so that when Jehoshaphat got there, there was nothing but plunder to pick up. And that's how God wants to work in your life. He's saying, if you'll give some of those things to me, I'll take care of it. And all you'll have to do is pick up the plunder. You know what plunder is? Like purses, (laughs) lazy boy recliners. Uh, It's it's TVs with nice remotes and smart TVs and 4Ks. It's, It's whatever they owned was now spread all over the place. And the army went and just picked up all that stuff. 
Isn't that really what Jesus did on his cross? For your sakes, he who was rich became poor, and that for his sake that you might become rich. He's saying, I'll take care of stuff for you. How many of you want to invite God into your life to start taking care of some stuff? Yes, we need to start to do that. So look, so there was this guy, uh, Asa, in 2 Chronicles, the verses will be up here. This guy, Asa, and it says, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa developed a serious foot disease. Yet even with the severity of the disease, he did not seek the Lord's help, but turned only to the physicians. There's not a problem with physicians. It's when you turn only to the physicians and don't include God in your healing. And it says, so he died in the 41st year of his reign. So I think he had the foot disease at 39. Yeah, 39. And then he died two years later of this foot disease. I wrote in my notes, God becomes upset when you let the medical field be the first or final say about your health. Say this with me. The medical field is not the first or final say about my health. I thank God for doctors. I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for doctors. Because especially if your faith isn't there, I thank God for what medicine and surgical procedures, and I believe all of that is a gift from God, and I believe that we should make use of that. But ultimately, who is the great physician over the hospital you're attending? He is referred to as the great physician. And if you're going to go to the hospital and never even look up to God, that is one of the surest ways to, be, to rely only on man for your help. Are you with me right now? I want to be clear. I'm all about doctors and medicine. I've taken a lot of it in my lifetime. But I want to live by faith, and I want to invite God's grace, and I want to see God do some things for me in my lifetime. I've seen a lot, but I want to see a whole lot more in the future. Amen? So here's the thing. When you have a symptom or a diagnosis, take it to God when? Immediately. Let me give you a story. I remember one time Heaven was in a skiing accident, um, and Emily was there with her, some snowboarder came down and just literally, he was like six foot six, this big guy, boom, knocked her out cold. They had to, they had to uh, airlift her to UVA. Um, actually, they were taking her by ambulance. Ambulance. Uh, tomato, tomato. Uh, shovel, shovel. That was friendly. Um, and Emily sends me a message crying. She says, They had to get a helicopter to land. Her vital statistics got so bad, they're afraid she's not even going to make it to the hospital. I'll never forget, I was in my bedroom. I just left prayer. I didn't go that night because I was in prayer meeting. Never mess with a praying person. Come on, guys. And I was like, I was in my, I'd just gotten home, and I dropped right in my bedroom, right next to, as soon as you go into my bedroom, I dropped to my knees right there, and I cried out to God. And I said, my daughter will live and somebody goes, well, she was going to live anyway. Maybe, maybe not. But I prayed that time. Emily prayed. We prayed on the phone. We believed God. I remember when I got to the hospital, Emily still had her ski boots on. She was like, clunk, 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 trying to go over steps, falls down, gets up. I was like, you know, you can take those off. She's like, what? Oh, I got ski boots on. I mean, that's how messed up we were in that moment. But God spared our daughter that night. I mean, obviously. You're like, I wonder what the end of the story is. Yeah, she lived. Um, <laughs> Come on, guys, right? <laughs> so, um, but look, um, so when you have a symptom or a diagnosis, take it to God immediately. Immediately go to God. Now, look at this. In contrast with Asa, there was this guy, Jabez. He had, he only had two verses in the entire Bible dedicated to him. Two verses, not two chapters, two verses. That much text. This is what it says. There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than all of his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, which means pain. (laughs) A lot of you want to name your kids pain. Um, Because his birth had been so painful. As you know, they prophesied names over kids back in those days. And you never want to speak over your kid what you don't want to see show up in their life. And Jabez had reached a point in life where the Bible says... He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory, be with me in all that I do, 
and keep me from how much trouble and pain? All of it. How much trouble and pain you want God to keep you from? All, say all of it. And you know what happened? It's just a simple little section of text, and God granted his request. Look at the contrast between Asa and Jabez, and ask yourself, which am I going to be? Am I going to be the person that never goes to God, or am I going to be the person who goes to God first? Am I going to be the person who is labeled pain, and I've seen lots of, he obviously had a reason to be going to God and asking for a change of life. He says, hey, God, here it is, the one named pain and all this. He says, God, I want you to bless me. I'm bringing you into my life. Man, I wish that this could go deep into our hearts right now like I'm feeling it. There are people who need to grab onto this. This could be your Jabez moment, your turning point, the moment when you bring God into partnership with you and you truly believe that God is going to bless you and expand your territory and be with you in all that you do and keep you from all trouble and pain say yes to that. We saved it. How are you going to face life? Like there's no God? Or are you going to pray for God's favor and for God's grace? Learn about what's available to you. This verse says in Psalms 103, praise the Lord all my soul and forget not all of his benefits. What are the benefits? Let me tell you something really cool about benefits. Our air conditioner went out uh, two weeks ago. And the guy came out, he goes, oh no, it's, it's gone. 7,500 bucks, cha-ching. I was like, dang, man, 7,500 bucks. Are you kidding me? This is, and Emily goes, wait a minute. You guys remember Pam Myers? She's a huge part of this church, right? A legendary woman. I mean, just such a great lady. Pam Myers was our insurance agent like over 10 years ago. She sold us this rider on our policy, this real cheap rider that covered all of your major appliances with a $500 deductible, all your major appliances, and it doesn't have to be a natural disaster. If they break, they replace them. Emily's like, I think we had some kind of rider on here. Let me check it out. Yeah, we did. And you know what? They didn't even come out to the house. They wrote us a check. $7,500. We got a whole new air conditioning unit in our house right now. Emily goes, I know that was God because I prayed and I believe. You know, and Emily's been in faith so much lately. If you need a prayer, you should get one from her. She prayed the other day for like, she's like, God, I thank you that money is coming into my life right now. Not that she's obsessed with money, but we just gave up a whole lot to different things. And she's like, I just believe God. And the uh, Shenandoah Valley Electric sends us this, this thing in our bill. It said negative uh, $1,066. And we're like, oh, what is that? So she calls them up. And they're like, yeah, you're right. Uh, when you first got your electric with us, um, you put down a deposit, and we're actually returning that deposit to you. She goes, that was 20 years ago. She goes, yeah, we're a little late. <laughs> she said, you'll be getting a check in a few days for 1000 bucks. Our air conditioner broke down. We got 7500 all paid for plus 1000 bucks. Who wants to go out to lunch? You know, so what I'm getting at is God can do so much in your life. And you know, I, I thank God I have a wife like that. Husbands and wives, you should like, you know, get into faith with one another. I look over at Emily, she's reading her Bible nonstop. She just finished it again. All the way, she's like, I'm done. All the way through it. Now what am I gonna do? Read it again. <laughs> you know, um, but the idea is forget not all of his benefits. Can you imagine if Emily had forgotten that benefit? we would have paid for the air conditioner. Think about it. What are the benefits? This is why we read the Bible. One of the reasons. Who forgives all your sins, that's a benefit. Who heals all your diseases, that's a benefit. Who redeems your life from the pit, that's a benefit. And crowns you with love and compassion. He heals how many of your diseases? All of them. He forgives how many of your sins? All of them. He redeems you from the pit. He crowns you with love and compassion. You're a crowned child of God. You are a crowned prince or princess of God walking around this world crowned. Crowned from the almighty God. That is the God who is your God. And you are crowned. But not if you forget the benefits. If you forget, you'll be doing it all in your own strength. You'll be paying for your, all your own stuff. But God, oh man, is this good today? Ask God for grace. Put up the shield of faith and then employ God's power. I wish I could go much deeper on this, but there, when you read through the New Testament, there are so many, um, there are so many places where it talks about these acts of grace and all the things that God will do. How about Philippians 4.13? Or, oh no, not 4.13. Philippians 4, towards the end, it says, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. That is a verse that Paul gave to his partners who were giving into his ministry. So that's not just for anyone. 
But if you're a giver, if you give to God's kingdom, you can stand on that verse. And you can say out loud, my God whom I serve shall supply all of my needs according to what? His riches in glory. In other words, God is never on a budget. He's never runs out. He has omnipotent power. I always say God can heal everyone all at once and the lights in heaven will never even flicker. You can make unlimited demands on his power and it will just keep flowing and flowing and flowing, but you have to remember the benefits. You know, I remember when we were young, we taught our kids to rely on God for healing. And over the years, every time they'd get sick, we'd pray. And I remember our kids started getting a pattern young in life where they would literally believe God. They got healed faster than anyone we ever prayed for. Like, I got a, I got a bad headache, you know? Oh, let's pray, let's pray about it. Boom, they would pray. Headache would be gone. I got this going on. Let's pray about it. Boom, that would be better. And then all of a sudden, our kids started saying things like, every time we pray, we get better. Whoa, that's the way you train your kids. You train your kids to believe that God can do anything. Then they won't struggle to try to make that philosophy change, to make that mind shift later on in life. For some people, it's going to be a little more difficult than others because there's so much programming you have to get out from underneath of. Can you say yes to that? The final force, and then we'll go home, is the, uh, the force of self-discipline. Self-discipline. This is what we would call, you know the Bible says, faith without what? Works is what? Dead. In other words, faith without, if you look at the Greek on this, what, what the Bible's actually saying, faith without corresponding action is dead. You have to act on your beliefs for the mountain to move. So we have to cooperate with God to have the kind of life that we say we want to have. How many of you want to start cooperating better with God so you can have the kind of life God wants you to have? So here's, here's a verse for you to hold on to. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Say strict training. They do it to get a crown that will last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Look at the next verse. No, I strike a blow at my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be just saying my body sometimes my body is trying to live in a way I don't want it to live. And he says, I strike at it to put it under submission to my spirit and my renewed soul. See, as a three-part being, when you get born again, your spirit is born again. Your spirit should become king of the three-part being. If you're not careful, your body, with all the cravings that it has, will continue to rule your life and keep you in a place of defeat. And what Paul is saying is that you've got to get your body under subjection. Are you with me right now? Do you see why I, I labeled this the force of self-discipline? Because you can have all the faith and you can ask for all that grace, but if you're not going to do something to put your body into alignment, then you're going to keep bringing yourself back down again. And so here's the idea. Um, and I'm out of time pretty much on this. Am I out of time on this? Look, man, you guys aren't even giving me any love this morning. That's fine. Um, I just wrote down, you know, you have to sweat for it. You have to resist cravings for it. And this is where the sermon gets so hard. And this is where I'm like, God, help me, help me. Emily always says, nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. Seriously? Bagels with cream cheese <laughs> taste way better than healthy feels. So that's where I need to change my mind in some places there. Right? I got that from my, from my mom. <laughs> I love her bagels. Um, so i just give you a couple things to write down. You can study these out maybe this week. You can improve your self-discipline with repentance and accountability to God. Remember, gluttony is a sin. And so the idea is, heaven told me, I preached a sermon a while back about the seven deadly sins. And heaven was like, you know what? I'm just going to go on a diet of just being responsible to God for my body. Of course, she was eating bad yesterday. She's like, Dad, don't call me out. I'm having a bad weekend. But do you know what? No fad stuff. I'm going to go and present myself before God, and I'm going to ask him to help me do right with my body. And she lost 19 pounds in about three weeks doing this, just being self-disciplined. Now, the reason I'm bringing it up is because this is the burst she needs to keep going. Come on, guys. Let's hear it for heaven. 
you know, look at this. So whether you eat or drink, oh, I forgot to put it on here. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, right? Okay, so the other thing you do to improve self-discipline, you do it, you improve it with knowledge. The Bible says my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Watch a couple of documentaries. Those documentaries will make you never eat at McDonald's again. That's why I haven't watched it. I heard about it. No way, man, I'm not watching that. I want to enjoy my McDonald's burger, you know, right? Am I, am I telling the truth here? You know, there are documentaries out there. If you eat, if you watch those, you'll be the whole time, those little people will be in on your shoulder going, don't eat that. Remember the documentary. Um, improve self-discipline with dreaming. I had a guy who was in, one of my business coaching clients was uh, way up in his 40s, almost 50 years old, and he was talking about getting back in shape. So I want to go back to the gym, getting back in shape. And everything was about appearance, appearance, appearance. And I ended up saying to him, you know what? When was the last time you were in health, you were healthy? He said, probably about 10 years ago or so, I was divorced and on the market. And he said, so, I said, so what was your motivator? I wanted to look good. Okay, cool. So is that working? Is, do you need that now? No, I'm in a great marriage. My wife could care less. So I said, we need another motivator. What's the motivator? He said, I don't know. I said, you got, you got little kids. I said, what if you don't make it to their graduation? Would that be bad? Oh, my God. You see the light going off? Yeah, that's it, man. Oh, and then he, then he started coming back. He's like, oh, I want to be there for my kids. I want to be there for my grandkids. I want to, I want to, I want to. And he starts it. Now he's got a dream. So you can improve self-discipline with the right dream. And then also improve self-discipline with fasting. And this is, this is like my final point in this. Here's what fasting does. Fasting says to your body, no! <laughs> That's what fasting says. Like, Emily gets mad at me for yelling at the dogs. By the way, they chewed one of our Ottomans in the family room this morning. I forgot to tell you before we went to church. I didn't want to ruin your church service. Um... <laughs> But, I mean, I'm closing now, so, you know. Um, yeah, I heard the rip. Like, I heard a tear all the way across it. And I was like, no! <laughs> Emily was in the shower. She thought there was an earthquake, like a 5.7, just a little 5.7. It was me yelling at the dog. But, I mean, you got you to gotta man up. <laughs> and fasting does that. When, when you fast and you make a commitment to God and you go, I'm not going to give myself this for a couple of days, um, it's, the Bible says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is opposite of what the Spirit wants. Think about what's going on inside of you. Sinful nature wants to do evil. The Spirit of God inside of you doesn't want to do that, wants to do right things. So it says these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not able to carry out your good intentions. You see that? What's the thought here? Win the fight. Win the fight. So he goes, so he goes, also in, Galatians, in Romans, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. If you live by its dictates, what will happen? You'll die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will what? Live. How many of you want to live? Win the war. Win the war. There's a war. Your flesh wants what you've always given it. And the only way you're going to break into a new level of lifestyle is you got to win the war. you got to put up a battle. Everybody's getting so uncomfortable right now, and I apologize for this, but I'm trying to make you live long because I love you so much. I want you, I want you, I want to hang out with you when we're 90 together. Dorothy, I want you in my life when, you're not, when I'm 90. So I don't know what that means, but I need you to just live like oldest woman to ever live. Still mows her grass by herself, still weed eats with scissors. I mean, <laughs> Dorothy Hall, the living legend. So, but keep watch and pray. So look at this verse here, Matthew, so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the body is what? Weak. So fasting is not just starving yourself from things you want. It's training your body to listen and be obedient. In the renewed life, your spirit is king, your soul is servant, your body is slave, and you have to keep it that way. And, and, and there's no other way but to train it. So how many of you are ready to step up in faith, step up in grace, and step up in self-discipline? i got three hands up in the whole building right now. That is a successful sermon. Let's stand and let's pray. Okay, so here is a bonus force for health. You ready? A cheerful heart does good like medicine. A cheerful heart does good like medicine. So the worst part of this sermon... 
when I stuck that picture of myself up and you guys were laughing, I was giving you free medicine. I was giving you free medicine. And if you want to copy that image, I'll send it to you. You can put it on the backdrop of your phone, and every day you can just get a good laugh. Um, a cheerful heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. I put a tweet up about this this week. Surround yourself with joyful people. Surround yourself with people who are lighthearted, full of joyfulness, and you'll live longer. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person right now, those watching on the Internet, um, everyone here, even the workers throughout the building that aren't getting to hear this this morning. Can we pray together right now? You pray with me right now, you know? I pray for people who are fighting with sickness right now. I pray for people who feel hopeless. Start to rise in this church right now. Mighty one. God Almighty, move in the medical and the health and the physical condition of the people in this church. I want my friends to live a long life. God, I pray that people would shift so much that they would wake up with strength every morning. One of my affirmations over the years, I wake up at 4.45 a.m. every day, alive, awake, and full of energy. I bounce from bed each morning at 4.45, alive, awake, and full of energy. I remember I said that over and over until I was finally waking up like that. And then Emily hated me for it for so long. But God, I just ask you in Jesus' name that you would shift people today into a place of health. Come on, church, let's pray out loud right now. We're praying. We're praying for people who the enemy is attacking right now. We're praying for the grace of God. We're praying for miracles right now. Father, you know, you know who's facing impossible situations in this church. I thank you that you're raising up a shield over this ministry, over this church, and over our community. We watch out over the community, even for those who don't attend this church. And we're asking you, God, to heal these children, all those that had their, their, uh, their, their uh, uh, donation sites on uh, on their on on Facebook, and we see this kid facing a medical condition, and that one, and this person asking for prayers, and that one, and we thank you, Father. We're praying responsibly over our community. We're praying, God, that you would move and that you would let faith be the banner over Stewart Straft, Augusta County, Stanton, Waynesboro, and Fishersville. We thank you now, Father, for all the families attending this church, even outside of here in Highland County, in Nelson County, in Rockbridge, in Rockingham, over in Albemarle County. We're asking you, Lord, to move over our region. We're asking you to heal people. We're asking you to make healthy people out of this church, Father. We give you our health. We give you our life. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much, Lord. Mm. Thank you, Father. thank you for what you're doing right now. I just pray for healing. Specifically, if you're here today, you know, just your health is not where you want it to be. Just raise your hands up to God. As I pray that God would see those hands going up right now and that God would heal and that he would do the impossible over people's lives right now, Father. I blanket this place with the grace of God right now and I ask you to work mighty miracles over people's lives today. Thank you so much, Father. People looking into the screen right now and they're saying, man, I wish I was there. Well, we're praying right through the screen that God would heal you, that God would restore you. Lord, let there be power to go out from this, Father, that it wouldn't be a struggle. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Thank you for testimonies. I thank you for a shift in the culture of our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, guys, let's thank God for everything he's doing. So God bless you guys. I'm going to go out to the parking lot because I want to, was trying to do that the last couple of weeks. I, I love to just high five people on their way out. I hope you guys have a tremendous Sunday, and we'll see you, uh, we'll see you next week. God bless you.